is as we have children that are asking, and I just want to make this known to, to you guys, if, if there are already any, any young children that begin to ask questions about uh, salvation, about Christ, uh, what does it mean to be baptized, these kinds of things. If you're a parent or grandparent and you've got kids that, that are curious and want to know some things, we have uh, a packet that we've put together that um, we like to give to children, to parents really. It's to put some tools, and grandparents, some tools in your hands to be able to sit down with them at times and read some different things to them, talk to them, ask some questions, answer some questions, that kind of thing. So if you are in a situation like that and you think, you know, I'd really like to share the gospel or my child or grandchild is asking some questions uh, and I feel like I'd like to have some resources about that, come see me because we've got, we've got something we'd like to put in your hands. Uh, we, we give these to any children that, that come forward or are inquiring about baptism, this kind of thing, because it, it really helps them begin to sort through and understand the gospel and how to be saved. So just keep that in mind. Um, the other thing is, number one, to just appraise about last Sunday, the things that we voted to do about uh, expanding our parking lot out back, uh, renovating our, uh, some areas here in the... Uh, CDC and making that where it's also part of our Sunday school, uh, kind of doing some painting and, and dressing up a little bit in this building, do uh, some new floor covering for our choir and, uh, and coat of paint in here, maybe a little bit of furniture, redo our sign out front, uh, putting some lighting in. Um, and so that, that's exciting. And I hope that you are excited about that. These are some wonderful things that God are. God is doing. We won't be able to do it all at once, but little by little, God will provide, and we'll we'll move along, and we'll uh, do these things. We've kind of put an order in there. We like to get get the building dressed up a little bit out front because right now we're kind of blending in with the the road and so forth. So we'd like to know folks, let folks see that something's happening here. Uh, so we're going to start there. But I hope you're excited about those things, and we'll be in prayer. Uh, and that God will provide as, along the way. But always remember this. It's really not about all of that, is it? The big thing is that these things enable us to serve Christ and to do the things that He's called us to do, to be the people He's called us to be. And Satan would love nothing more than to get us sidetracked, uh, either you know, focusing too much on it or not focusing enough on it or arguing over it. He, he doesn't care. It's just as long as we are not focused on Christ and doing the work of the Lord. So let's, let's just keep, keep our hearts focused on the Lord and on the ministry of the Word, and God will bless us, and He'll do these good things in our midst, and, uh, and He'll open ministry and expand ministry and do the things that he's calling us to do. So um, just, I don't know, felt led to say that. So I hope that blesses your heart. Um, John chapter 18. We're going to spend three parts looking into the death of Christ. We're in the, the central part of our faith. Uh, we're always on holy ground. Amen? But... Here, we are in the Holy of Holies. We, we are in something that we as believers ought to give special attention and prayerful attention because this is the content of our faith. If you came here today thinking or asking in your heart, what is all this business about Jesus Christ? What is... This, uh, what's all the, this? What, why did it make such a difference that Jesus died? Why do people gather at churches every week? You know, because a Jewish peasant died over 2,000 years ago. If you've wondered this, you know, what, what makes the difference? Then we are here. We are at that time 
when you can begin to understand what Christ has done for, for us. And so I hope that God will use it that way in your heart and in your life as we move through these next weeks um, on the death of Christ. And we'll also be looking eventually at the resurrection and so forth. But I just hope you'll come in each week saying, you know, Lord, show me Christ. Lord, show me why. What, what did he do? What did it make? You know, what does it mean to me? Uh, Lord, that, what do you want to say to me? I hope that's your heart's cry as you will come each day, uh, each Lord's day, uh, and hear about the, the death of our Savior. All right, so the death of Christ, John chapter 18, verses 28, and I'm going to read uh, and finish out chapter 18. We're going to be hitting into 19, but I, I'm not going to read that. We'll read that as we move to it, okay? So verse 28, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. He was er it was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat, th and, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered to him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? And Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priest have delivered you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who, who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one, more, one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning and we pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would illuminate our hearts and minds, that we might behold Christ, that the Word of God might go forth and have free course and be glorified in us, that we might, Lord, be granted faith to believe and to repent, to follow Christ, to see Christ, to know Him, as He says here in this passage, they that know the truth, listen to me. Father, we pray that there be any dear person here today who has been thinking over these questions. Who is Jesus? And why does He matter? I pray that today you would speak into their hearts and show them the truth about Jesus Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Athanasius of Alexandria, one of the church fathers, wrote many years ago, The power of the cross of Christ has filled the world. The power of the cross of Christ has filled the world. Have you ever thought of that? Jewish peasant over 2,000 years ago. He owned no palace. 
He had no connections, no money. And yet, there are men and women who worship Him and believe in Him and read of Him in every corner of the globe every day of the week. The power of the cross of Christ has filled the earth. Why? Why? What's the deal? I feel like sometimes that that is what's going on in the mind of many of us in America and probably Europe. We that have had the gospel and have had the knowledge of Christ and have had the Bible for many, many years, have now come to the place where we take it for granted. And in fact, we've probably moved on beyond that to the place that now it doesn't even matter to us anymore. We don't just take it for granted. We've forgotten why it was even important. When there are places in the world, in China or South Africa, Many places in the world, in the Middle East, where Christianity has broken in afresh, and thousands and thousands of people, men, women, children, are giving their souls and hearts, turning from their sins and believing in Jesus Christ in record numbers. And they don't have to ask the question, why is Jesus important? Because they have been in darkness and are now beginning to see the truth of God in Christ Jesus again. Many of those places is, are, are the birth, you might say, of, Jesus, of, of, the, of Christianity. So they, Christianity started there, then it was gone and disappeared, and in many ways it's now come back to them again uh, these thousands of years later uh, and to see... Uh, it began to flourish again. And that's wonderful. Praise God. And I pray that that would continue to happen. But meanwhile, let's pray that God would renew in our midst an understanding, a belief, a freshness, a revival of the faith of Jesus Christ in our midst. It's a cry and shame where we are in our day. What, what is it about? What is Christianity about? Is it about rituals, robes, crosses, fancy buildings, cathedrals, politics? Is it about all that? No. It's not about any of that. In fact, the early church had none of that. Most of the people in the early church were peasants. They didn't have power. They didn't have money. They didn't have buildings. But they had Christ. And they had the Word of God. And they had salvation. And through those people, the world was turned upside down. Through those people, the power of the cross of Christ, as Athanasius said, filled the earth. The Roman Empire that sought to extinguish Christianity, that blamed Christianity for its own, person, its own decline, eventually, almost 400 years later, embraced Christianity. How does that happen? It seemed that the more Christians the Roman government killed, the more Christians there were. The more, Christ, the more Bibles they burned, the more Bibles there were. They banned Bibles and burned Bibles, and now the New Testament is the most well-attested document in ancient history. We have over 6,000 manuscripts or fragments of the New Testament alone. There is not one ancient document that even comes near 
to the New Testament. And yet the Roman government was burning Bibles and destroying Bibles as fast as they could find them. Why? Well, how does this happen? Because there's Jesus Christ is much more than a Jewish peasant. What happened over 2,000 years ago on that cross in Jerusalem? What is the meaning of all this? Why does it matter? What did he do? There were thousands of people crucified on Roman crosses. The cross was merely the Roman government's equivalent to our modern-day electric chair. It was just capital punishment. We hang them now on our, on our walls. We wear them as jewelry. To a Roman, over 2,000 years ago, it would have looked like having an electric chair hanging around, around your neck. None of us would do that, would we? It's like, did you see this new golden electric chair I bought? I bought this over at Kay's the other day. Or Jerry. I don't get any, I don't get any kickback for that. I just happen to know Jared because I've been brainwashed. <laughs> but we wouldn't do that, would we? We wouldn't have an electric chair around our neck. But that's what the cross was. It was the way the Roman government put its criminals to death. No, it's because now we look at that cross and we see our Savior. We see what Christ has done for us. And so in our minds, in some fashion, in a spiritual fashion, it seems beautiful. But it's only because of Christ. Well, let's think together in the next three sermons. We'll talk about this. We'll think together about John's account of the crucifixion, the death of Christ. And so the first thing I want us to think about this morning is what I call the crooked trial. The crooked trial. Remember we said that the cross is the capital punishment method of the Roman government. And we see here the religious leaders of the Jewish nation seeking to put Jesus Christ to death. They are threatened by Him. Their, their power is threatened by Him. Their religious organization is threatened by Him. But remember, the nation of Israel at this time is not a sovereign nation. It, is under, it has been conquered by the Roman government. They can't put people to death. Now, they did have their own court, the Sanhedrin. They could operate and do some laws and some things like that, but they did not have the power of the death penalty. That's why Jesus is arrested by the temple guard, not the Roman soldiers. The temple guard is sent out by the crooked high priest, and Jesus is arrested and brought in before the high priest and given a false trial. They were not, the Sanhedrin was not supposed to meet at night. And yet here they were in the middle of the night holding court. All of this stuff was done under the cover of darkness. None of it was right. None of it was legit. Jesus even said, I, I spoke openly in the temples. Nothing I said or taught was in secret. Why are you here? Why do you have me here at night under the cover of darkness if I've done something wrong? And so we see that now, as day, the day has dawned, that they now whisk him away to the Roman government because they don't have the power to put Jesus to death. And so uh, they take him into Pilate, and we see that, number one, he's innocent, but he's betrayed by his disciples in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 18. Judas, we saw, cuts a deal with the religious leaders to sell Jesus, to deliver Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You, on, you that come on Sunday night 
Remember, Joseph is sold for 20 pieces of silver uh, by his brothers. Here, you might say Jesus is sold by his fellow Jews, his brothers, you might say, uh, by, for 30 pieces of silver. And so Jesus is innocent, but he's delivered over. We see that he's innocent, but he's falsely arrested in verses 12 and 13. We see that he's innocent, but he's falsely accused in verse 28 through 32. They accuse him of one thing after another. In fact, Pilate even says, you know, well, take him and deal with him according to your law. And they said, well, if he wasn't guilty, we would, would we have brought him here? How do you like that? How would you like to be arrested and taken to jail? And you say, why am I in jail? Well, if you weren't guilty, you wouldn't be in jail. What happened to innocent until proven guilty, you know? What kind of logic is this? These people are saying, we don't need a trial. We brought him to you because he deserves death. And, and so you don't even need to ask us any more questions. Just go ahead and put him to death. And Pilate says, um, I need to talk to him. So he pulls, Pilate pulls him in and begins to talk to Jesus and says, Are you a king? And Jesus says, basically, yes, I'm a king, but my kingdom is not of this world. If my people, my followers were of this world, then they would rise up and deliver me out of your hand. But my kingdom is not of this world. They that know the truth or love the truth, hear me. And then, of course, Pilate being a, of Western mind, looks at Jesus and says, what is truth? And walks out. Not knowing that he's standing in the presence of the truth. Jesus is the truth. But Pilate is a Roman. But even Pilate comes back and says, I find no fault. I find no guilt in this man. That's why every one of these, he's innocent, but he's betrayed by his disciples. He's innocent, but he's falsely arrested. He's innocent, but he's falsely accused. He's innocent, but he's put to death, we're going to see. And yet he was declared innocent. Pilate says, I find no guilt in this man. So if you have any question about who Jesus is, was he just a man that another Jew, maybe a criminal, maybe not, you might want to rethink that. The authorities of the Jewish nation tried to build a case against him before their own authorities and before the authorities of the Roman government and still could not prove that he had done anything wrong. Pilate said, I find no guilt in this man. He could see that they were bringing him to before them out of jealousy. And so he says, take him and judge him according to your law. And they said, no, we can't put a man to death. Look at that. They've already sentenced him. But notice what they said his guilt is. You know, occasionally you'll hear someone that says, well, you know, Jesus never claimed to be God. Jesus never, never really claimed to be divine. You know, that's just something that fundamentalists and, and people like that, that's stuff they've made up. And they put that on Jesus. The, but... The early church didn't believe that, and Jesus didn't teach that. That's just what people today believe, that, that kind of want to take it. They take it too far. Well, uh, look what the Jews said about Jesus. We want him put to death because he says he's the Son of God. Okay? I didn't make that up. You didn't make that up. Jesus said it. 
And they were willing to kill him for it. Okay? So no, that's not something that we made up. That's something that Jesus taught. And we ask the question, what is important about Jesus? Why was the death of a Jewish peasant two, over 2,000 years ago important? Because that was not just a, just a Jewish man, but that was the Son of God. That was God's Son on this earth in the form of a man. What we call the Incarnation. The Son of God, born to the Virgin Mary. Miraculous birth. Heralded by angels. Announced by a star. Followed by wise men. Visited by shepherds. The King had come. So many today are... You know, what's wrong with our world? We need to be, we want to be world changers. We want to change the world. We want to make it just. We want to make it right. We want to correct the injustices and do all the, guess what? You will fail like everybody else did. The only one that can do that has already come. And I submit to you that the only people that are making a real difference in this world are the followers of His kingdom. That's the big deal. You know why? Because they know that the only hope for this world is the coming kingdom. The king of righteousness. He is the only hope for this world. That was the Son of God upon that cross. The crooked trial, Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 34 Peter said, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. Miracles. Okay? These were witnesses. They saw it. This wasn't Peter standing up and saying, you know, well, it says here that Jesus did miracles. Folks, Peter stood up in front of hundreds of people and said, you guys saw, you saw lepers, people who had to go down the street with their face covered, saying, get away from me, unclean, unclean, unclean. And Jesus Christ said, be clean. And they were healed. They saw it. They saw a man that had been lying there and could not get to the water to be helped. Because he could not move his legs. And Jesus said, get up and take your bed. And that man who could not walk, could not even crawl, stood up, folded up his bed, and went home. They saw it. They were witnesses. This was not make-believe. This was not made up. Peter stood up and said, you have seen that God did great things through Jesus Christ. You saw it. And Jesus said he was attested by God. You know what that means? That Jesus stood up and said, I'm the Son of God, and I'll prove it to you. And then he did these things, and God did these things in our midst so that no one could argue with what Jesus was saying, that they could know that he was, in fact, the very man that he said he was. In fact, at one point he's in the house and there's a man lying there in his bed. And there's so many people gathered in that they wanted to see what was going to happen. That You know how those houses are in that area? They're kind of clay roofs. People begin to climb on the roofs. They're hanging in the windows. They want to see. This is bigger than a, than a blockbuster movie. They want to see what is getting ready to happen. It's so bad that these guys, Jesus is in the room, these guys want to get their friend to Jesus. They began to pull the roof top off. You know how houses are built side by side and this kind of thing. So you can get on. People you, a lot of times would dwell on top of the house. You know, they'd sit out there and it was cool at night and so forth. They start pulling up the roof of the house. They lower their friend down in a bed in front of Jesus. And the Pharisees stand over them. These are the religious rulers. 
They stand around at Jesus and they say, who gave you the authority to do all this? Can I reinterpret that for you? Just exactly who do you think you are? We're the religious big shots around here. Who are you? You didn't go to the best seminary. Exactly who are you? You're nobody. We're the big shots around here. By what authority do you do all this stuff? And you know what Jesus said? I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, okay? I'm going to make it real. <laughs> Jesus looks at him and says, I tell you what, which is easier? For me to tell you by what authority that I'm doing all these things? Or to tell this man that can't walk to get up? And he said, so you'll know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins and to, and to heal. He says, get up and take your bed and walk away. And that man got up, folded up his bed, and walked away. Now who, who gave him the authority? God the Father. That's the big deal. And the real church of Jesus Christ all over the world, it may have buildings, it may not have buildings. It may have crosses, it may not have crosses. It may have money, it may not have money. But it has Jesus Christ, and it has the Word of God, and it has the Gospel, and it saves souls. That's what it's about. That's who Jesus Christ is. We see the crucifixion. He bore the cross in chapter 19. And the cross bore His title. He carried the cross. He carried His own cross. But on that cross, of course, if you were convicted by the Roman government, if you were a thief or a criminal or a murderer or whatever, when they nailed you physically with spikes after beating you with 39 stripes with a Roman lash which had, thir had, had uh, the leather whip and in the piece, at the end of each piece of leather it had a stone or a piece of glass. So when, when the whip would hit you, the stone or the glass would cut into you and, cut and rip your flesh. And you imagine 39, they strap you to a pole and 39 times you're hit with that. Okay. You say, well, why 39? Because the Romans had, had so made this a scientific thing. They had figured out that most men died at 40. So that's how close. That's how, how, how close you were brought to death. Now after you've had 39 stripes and they beat you up and all kinds of things, then they nail you with spikes to the wooden cross after you've carried your own cross to the place of crucifixion. Then they erect the cross in public view. So you're lying up there bleeding, dying, naked, in complete humiliation. And above your head is nailed a placard it says why you're there. You know, a murderer, a robber, a thief, you know, whatever. On Jesus, in three different languages, it said, here is the king of the Jews. Here is the king of the Jews. And the Jewish leaders were furious. They said, take that off. Put on there that he said he was the king of the Jews. He's not our king. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. I'm not changing it. Why? Because you know what? He's not only the king of the Jews, but he's the king of everyone that believes in him. He was our savior. 
He was dying vicarious, what we say, vicariously for us. Okay, what does that mean? In other words, in the Old Testament, God taught us something about through sacrifice. He said once a year the high priest was to take a lamb and he was to put his hands on the lamb and confess the sins of the people. Then he would take another one and send that one out into the desert. He'd take this one and go sacrifice it to God. Now what was that saying? He was saying that in essence our sins would be gone away. But our sins are transferred to something else. And that one dies for our sins because sin always demands death. Okay, God is absolutely righteous. So an infinite God who's infinitely holy is offended infinitely by sin and therefore sin is an infinite violation of an infinite God and therefore it demands an infinite punishment. So either you and I have to pay for our own sins infinitely in hell, that's why hell is eternal, or an infinite being must take our place. Now who was that? Jesus, the Son of God. You say, well, God, why doesn't God love me? God loves you more than anybody does. He took your place. He died so that you could live. The cost of forgiveness, Peter says, he says, knowing this, that you were ransomed from the futile ways, your sinful ways, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. All the money in the world. God owns everything. If you had a dump truck load of platinum or diamonds, I don't know, was anything more, more valuable than that? I don't know. I'm not sure. Titanium? I, I don't know. Plutonium? <laughs> but if you had a dump truck load of, of, of all those, you think God needs that? No. no. Gold or silver or any of those things could not buy the forgiveness of sin. Only a sacrifice paying for that sin could do it. Now either you and I pay for it eternally in hell or the eternal Son of God paid for it for us. And that He did. So He says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that would be Adam, so death spread to all men because of all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, that's Adam, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. He says, but what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved for, the heart, for with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, confession to Jesus is made. Now Jesus died on the cross. But that doesn't save everybody. We have to confess our sins and believe in Him and follow Him. And Christ says, He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why Jesus' death 
was a big deal. It's the one thing all this world needs. So what about you? Do you know him? Is Jesus Christ just a historical figure to you? That's what he was for me. If when I was before I was saved, if you'd have come to me and said, Do you believe in Jesus? I would have said, Yeah, sure. You just said, Do you believe the Bible's the word of God? I'm sure, absolutely. Are you a Christian? Yes, yes. I'm a I'm a Baptist, even though I didn't go to church. <laughs> but I would have said it. And then I began to hear the gospel day after day. God began to work in my life. He began to show me what a sinner I was. He began to show me who Jesus really is. Jesus wasn't just an innocent man who was wrongfully put to death by the Roman government. But Jesus was a son of God. He was the one thing that all time was looking for. And he was dying on the cross on purpose. Not as a victim, but as a victor. As a sacrifice that I might be forgiven of my sins and reconciled to God and brought into his kingdom and given eternal life. And I remember the day when I heard the gospel. I was sitting in my living room. I'd heard it many times. But that one day, it's like somebody just reached over and turned the lights on. And I thought, that's why Jesus died. It wasn't just an accident. It wasn't just a tragedy. He was dying for me. And I confessed my sins and believed in Jesus and was saved. What about you? Do you know Jesus like that? He wants to know you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. We pray that you would work in us, draw us to Christ, help us to see him. Help us to know him. Help us to understand what we're reading here. Help us to treat it in the cosmic way that it should be treated. It's not a fairy tale. It's not just just history. It's not just a tragedy. But this is the crossroads of all history. This is where we have access to you, where we can be forgiven, where we can be reconciled, where we can know God. Do that in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Um,